Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Sunrise by Sherry Sellers The hospital lobby hummed with people in a medley of moods. The bright lights shocked after walking in from the pre-sunrise air in the parking lot. The balloon bouquet I carried filled the space in the elevator we didn't occupy. Luckily, we were alone. My husband Vince placed the bassinet on the floor, rubbing his shoulder. Heavy, he explained. We smiled at each other, giddy as two kids at their first formal dance. I can't believe we're finally parents, I said. Third time's the charm. Our hands met and clung tight. The call had come just past midnight. Bree was in labor, and we needed to come immediately. Our car was already packed when her due date came and went. We drove from our tiny town in the mountains to Sacramento. As the elevator rose up, I started thinking of the other babies that were almost ours. The first time, the birth mother, a young girl of seventeen, changed her mind. We never met the baby. But the last one, Aiden, lived with us for twenty-two days before his birth mother took him away. Soft, squirmy, and baby smell sweet, he was ours until he wasn't. The elevator dinged. I squeezed Vince's hand. He squeezed back. The doors opened, revealing Anne from the agency. Next to her was a stern older woman. This is Bree's mother, Anne explained. We nodded politely. How's Bree? I asked. The woman studied us before answering. She's fine. She glanced at Anne before clearing her throat. Both Bree and Kiona are fine. Kiona? Next to us, the nurse's station buzzed with activity. Phones rang as women in bright scrubs resembling pajamas dashed around carrying clipboards, pushing carts, or having a quick gossip. I'm sorry, the woman said. She hesitated briefly before walking away. The bassinet thumped loudly on the elevator floor. The balloon bouquet let loose floated out of the elevator. The windows at the end of the hallway revealed sherbet skies and swirls of clouds. The branches of a massive valley oak tree shifted slightly as a lesser goldfinch danced from branch to branch. We watched as the promise of sunrise narrowed until the elevator doors shut. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dirsch. I'm your producer and editor. I think there's something about holidays that makes me want to explore the bittersweetness of what can sometimes be the saccharine emotion. If you think back to our Thanksgiving Day episode, I actually titled it Thankful with a Question Mark, and it was about what does gratitude look like in our very real and very complex world where things don't always go right. And so in thinking about the week leading up to Valentine's Day, I found myself putting together a Broken Hearts episode. And spoiler alert, this is not your Valentine's Day episode. There is a Valentine's Day episode coming. It's going to be a special this weekend. And I don't want to give away too much, but it's going to be a little bit of a Valentine's Day extra on your feed and a little bit lighter than today's episode. Today's episode is more about the kind of tough side of love a little bit. And we started with what's going to be the most emotionally challenging story of this episode, and that is Sunrise, which I think is all about all forms of love, parenthood, as well as romance, where you're flying up. I remember there's this line, I love Anna Green Gables, I'm like every person my age who's a literature nerd, I grew up on those books, and there's a line where she talks about she loves flying up on the wings of anticipation when something is coming and it's almost worth the thud and Marilla her guardian who is the very logical pragmatic one says that maybe it does but she'd rather walk calmly along and do without both flying and thud and I think Sunrise captures a very bittersweet moment in the lives of these people that they're soaring up on those wings of expectation and you wonder if it is worth the thud when it all comes crashing down. I like to write my own ending to the story and I do think that they end up happy as parents in the beyond of that story, but I guess take from it what you will. We are staying with the Broken Hearts theme, but we are going to go much lighter with the rest of this episode. Some humorous stuff is coming. 
Coming up next is a story by M. Pepper Longline. I want to point out her name to you again because she's not introduced at the beginning of the story because her story is untitled. And when you listen to it, I think you'll understand why. And then we're closing with a comedic story about what happens when a broken down, tired waitress opens up her thighs. And trust me, it's not what you're thinking. So that's our three today. I do wish you a happy Valentine's Day, whatever plans you have for this weekend be they saccharine gooey romantic full of anticipation a little twinge with broken heart and reality or someplace in the middle and there is a special episode that you will see sometime over the weekend that hopefully will bring a little bit of a lift to your valentine's day in the meantime have a wonderful week and enjoy our next two stories coming up see you next time He feels the arrow as a bruising blow to his back, and looks down to where the gleaming tip only just breaks his sternum. The bowman's aim has been right and true. This may or may not be a mercy. Hands spasm and he thinks he should pull the weapon out, if he can reach it, but then decides to do so would only be to unplug his heart. He tests his chest gingerly, the hand coming away wet and covered red, his life forfeit, and he never had a say in the matter. He is suddenly aware of the thudding of his heart, and he curls in on himself, shaking all over now in a chill sweat. He is dying, there on his sofa, and he squeezes his eyes shut against the bright of lights overhead. He is desperate to get into his mind and find peace, but there is none. Thoughts bounce as balls in empty spaces. To pull in breath feels impossible. He is suffocating. He can taste his heart on his tongue, as if it were trying to escape his body through his mouth. The ruin of his clothes, his couch, himself. He should have been safe at home, insulated, untouchable. But if there was any one thing he would walk out of life knowing, it was there was really no such thing as safe. Cupid's work is a bloody business. Sprawl by Christopher Woods Minnie collapsed on her green imitation leather couch and flipped on the Merle Haggard CD. She was whipped after the night at Country Steak Shop. Friday nights were murderous things, with the all-you-can-eat chicken fried steak. People, mostly fat, the rest slobs, plus kids in shorts and flip-flops, lined up out the door. Her bunions screamed, but she kept delivering platters of mystery meats lathered with imitation cream gravy until the kitchen closed at nine. Now she could try to recover as she nursed her bottle of vin rosé. Her starched pink uniform, name tag, orthopedic nursey shoes, and hairnet were scattered on the floor. She looked at her heavy breasts. Hey, you two, she said. We survived another night. Her belly was huge, and she wished this wasn't so, but she too had eaten way too much of the make-believe banana pudding at the steak shop. For way too many months. It was fake stuff, not anything like Mama used to make at the farm, but many believed that Merle would still love her if their star-crossed paths ever came together, even if she didn't know for sure if Merle liked his girls plump or skinny, and this heavy doubt made her so nervous that she ate more and more pudding. She was thinking about slimming down when she noticed the dark spot on her inner thigh. It was new. What had she done or run into to cause a bruise? She pulled her heavy white leg up as close as she could without hurting, and what she saw frightened her. It was no bruise. It was a new strip center, just a few stores she could see so far. There was a five-buck haircut joint, a 50-cent store, a used wig shop, and a pizza place. The pizza place was so new their sign wasn't even up yet. She took a big sip of Vin Rosé, and God help her, there was another strip center growing on her other thigh. This one was larger, and given the location, much more intimate. There was no zoning that she could see. There was a tanning place, a naughty negligee's R.S. outfit, and a psychic reader that she imagined was a cover for something nasty. She could see people parking their cars in the brand spanky new parking lot and coming to the stores. She even recognized a few of them from church in the country steak shop, and one woman she knew from A.A. 
Beyond the strip centers, she could see new subdivisions reaching into and swallowing the fields. There were cars and driveways, and kids riding bikes, teenagers selling drugs on corners, and thieves carting things out of houses while people were away at work. She saw steeples of churches and admired them, but she also saw, what do you call it, a mosque, kind of like that castle at Disney World, but not, where the suicide bombers lived. There were car repair stores and drive through donut shops. It was exhausting to see it all, and especially on her body, even in crevices where the sun don't shine. Mercy me, she said. What's happening, she wondered. She wanted to know what was in that imitation cream gravy. It had to be that. Her vin rosé had never let her down before. She looked closer to see if there was a new country steak shop coming about, but so far there wasn't. Secretly, she hoped there would be, one with a nicer manager than Bert, who farted and belched so much she was afraid her tips might suffer. She tried to flex the muscles in her thighs to see more, but she was too tired and fat, and she feared that the muscles had left town for good. Merle, she said, I've only had one glass of vin rosé, what's happening to me? But he crooned on in that crusty voice that always sent shivers up and down her spine. Her thighs always had the open sign out for Merle, but she was afraid the new businesses would keep him away. She was afraid to look at her inner arms. She feared more and worse discoveries. She couldn't look at her thighs again, but she could feel them growing, swelling up as more stores opened. Which was why she struggled so in the morning once she awoke and remembered she had volunteered to work Saturday lunch for Sandy, who needed to drive 300 miles for an abortion. Saturday lunch was all about catfish, all you can eat. She fought like hell to get her stockings on, but they ripped with all the new businesses coming about. Hell, she said, I'll just go without my nylons. She staggered to her battered Buick in the driveway and drove on the feeder all the way to the country steak shop where a line was already forming. On the way there, she surveyed her thighs again, balancing her mug of strong coffee and trying to keep her eyes on the road. That's when she noticed the psychic reader's store again. Now, out in front and for all in God to see was a placard that read, Psychic Assistant Required. Inquire within. Many almost drove off the road. This was a divine sign to her. She decided she would drive to that psychic store and apply for the job. Maybe it wasn't a cover for something nasty. Maybe she was just being prejudiced because of the way she felt about gypsies and their kind. Or, if it was something nasty, maybe she could get used to it. She wasn't getting any younger, and her Merle had never shown up in all the years she had worshipped him. As she drove past the country steak shop, she could see the line of people outside waiting for the restaurant to open. It was like a shrine being overrun by zealous pilgrims. She saw Bert standing in the door, and she knew he was smelling up the foyer. She sipped her coffee and didn't stop. She kept driving. She headed to the new parts of town, the new world. She kept one eye on the road and the other on her thigh, which she knew would lead her to new life just a few miles away. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.